everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Amber Goodwin. I'm the Artistic Director here at the Regina Folk Festival. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, take the time to acknowledge that we here are gathered on Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Nehewak, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, as well as the Métis Michif homeland. And we respect and honor the treaties made on all territories and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. And we're committed to move forward in partnership with Indigenous nations um, in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, today, we're, this is, we're, we're all gathered online and in person for an artist talk with Ido Pimienta and Shindy, um, moderated by director curator Alyssa Fioran. Um, I want to say that on behalf of the Regina Folk Festival, it's been a, a real pleasure to work with the Dunlop Art Gallery and their teams. They're incredibly professional and wonderful and easy to work with. Um, just making everything a complete joy. And uh, I'm, we're also incredibly honored to be working with such incredible artists locally and visiting um, here on Treaty 4. I'm going to take a minute here to introduce our guests. Lido Pimienta is a Colombian Canadian musician, singer, and songwriter. She rose to prominence after her 2016 album La Pesa won the Polaris Music Prize. Her music incorporates a variety of styles and influences, including traditional indigenous and Afro-Colombian musical styles, such as cumbia, as well as contemporary synth pop and electronic music. Shimbi is an artist, writer, and administrator who currently works and resides between Treaty 1 and Treaty 4 territories. They've received funding from municipal, provincial, and national arts councils, as well as awards from local and transnational arts organizations. Their practice engages with themes of place and its abstraction from a diasporic, queer, and feminist perspective. Currently, they are the executive director of the Saskatchewan Home Pool Cooperative, co-director of the Windex Festival of Moving Image, and, and also guest curator of the forthcoming Art and Wonder publication. Alyssa Furon currently holds the position of director curator at the Dunlop Art Gallery, Regina Public Library. Integral to Firon's curatorial practice is a community-based approach that prioritizes the voices of historically underrepresented groups. Her national experience as an arts professional has equipped her with a broad understanding of the Canadian arts sector and its needs. Um, thank you all three for joining us. And Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm super excited to be um, to be here, have you all here, and to be joined by Lidu Pimienta um, and Shindi. And um, yeah, I also just want to echo Amber's words about um, Folk Fest being great partners to work with. So thank you for making this all possible. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So the formal part of the discussion um, is going to last around 30 to 40 minutes or so. And then I'm going to leave around 5 to 10-ish minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so we'll take your questions in the audience here in person as well as online. So if you are watching us from home online, please write your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them towards the end. Okay, so... Um, so we're in this exhibition space. Um, it's called For Those of Us Who Live at the Shoreline. Um, and it was guest curated by um, curator and critic Sarah Ty Black. So I thought I would work with some of Sarah Ty Black's words to just ground our conversation and to, to open things up. So in Sarah Ty Black's essay that they wrote for this exhibition, they say, what might freedom look like for each of us? What might it feel like? whether it's tactile, spiritual, and social elements. I hope that these spaces can act as sites for contemplation for future making, present living, and for so much more than just enduring. Um, so with those words kind of situating ourselves and grounding the discussion, um, my first question is for Lido in terms of the work that you're doing um, of future making. So I think that most people are quite familiar with your work as a singer-songwriter, um, perhaps less familiar with your work as a visual artist. So can you talk about how you're doing that work of future making through your visual arts practice? 
and maybe how those realms overlap for you. Yeah, I um, I create music the same way that I create anything visual. Even musically, I see sounds as one that is about to paint, would see or use a chromatic circle. So um, I don't really see myself as a singer, painter. I, I just see myself as an artist. And um, I guess in, in terms of building for a future or creating for a future, I'm always concerned and hyper aware of everything that I do, say, whatever version of my artistry that people get to see that it leaves behind um, traces that only have to do with art. I, I feel like I want to leave a legacy of art, you know, but of course there's, um, it, it's not that easy, right? It, it, it gets complicated because, um, Patriarchy, <laughs> capitalism, you know, you know, because it's like I, I see myself as an artist, period, you know, but it's like, and you were, were born in Colombia. So that was, must have been hard for you, right? It wasn't. It was warm. <laughs> I had the beach five minutes from where I live. So, you know, that that's kind of my thing. It's like, I'm, I guess, in terms of, of what I'm what I'm doing next or what I'm doing now, it's yeah. always a reivindication of the sublime as 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 Caribbean, you know. So that's like a prime example of, 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 of what I'm thinking about and what I hope that I portray with all the things that I do. Right. And you have a background in curatorial work as well, right? That's that that's my debt. Sorry, that's my career. Um, yeah. <laughs> Art criticism and curatorial practice. Um, I won't say the school because I. Um, but um, I, you know, I, I was a mother pretty, pretty early. I, I became a mother at twenty, and um, and I and I married when I was nineteen. Remember when I talked about the patriarchy? <laughs> you can't live with your boyfriend if you're not married. <laughs> um, but that's another talk. But anyways, I. I, I've always been an artist and I've always been in art, I've always been creating, but when you become a parent or a mother or you're a, a, a child's caregiver, you you instantly think like, oh, I have to have a real job. So to me, curatorial practice was, you know, this is this is a real job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and But I also didn't see the complications in that, so. Um, I guess what was good about going through school to become an art critic and curator is that it, it helped me understand how to express art, how to how to yeah. talk about art in a way that people can connect with it. And I have taken that into my music and my my my, my visual art. So it it uh, it has it helped me in that way. Not the student then, but. <laughs> everything else is, is is good right it's like yeah like i i know where my vision comes from and i know where i'm going and that helps with yeah. you know, establishing all those ideas mm -hmm. yeah i love that i love that you see the practices as one and the same like there's kind of a continuum so i appreciate that um so the next question is for shimbi so similar question for you, but I, I also want you to just talk about your video work that is here in the exhibition. So for those of you who may not be aware, Shimbi's work is just at the back wall behind you. So I encourage you to check, I you to check it out after the talk. Um, but I do want Shimbi to just tell us a little bit about your work. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah. And Lita. Yeah. And Sarah Chai Black. <laughs> Full name. <laughs> uh, so this work is called Iyaya Ayat, and it was made in 2010 on Super 8 when my grandmother was living in Athens at the time. And uh, it's a work about diasporic longing and family, and also a sort of matrilineal uh, quest of sorts 
And it's still pretty dear to my heart. It was made through a program called the Mosaic Women's Film Project through the Winnipeg Film Group, developed by filmmaker Cecilia Araneda, who was a longtime executive director of that Artist Trend Center in Winnipeg. And it's so important for me to name her name because without a lot of the work that she did in a historically white institution, in a historically patriarchal institution, both of those things are at the core of a lot of filmmaking spaces. Um, folks like me wouldn't have been able to make work in ways where the context was one where we were seen and held as opposed to just provided supports and services. Uh, I come from uh, artists. Uh, my mother, shout out to my mom. Hi, mom, I know you're watching. I love you. Also, Lito, my mom was like, Oh, I'm so proud of that, Lito. <laughs> I was talking to her. Grandma! <laughs> <laughs> my mom is not watching. <laughs> my mother is watching her telenovela right now. Yeah. It's recorded. She, <laughs> she won't see it. <laughs> well, my mom's watching for both of us. Hey, mom. <laughs> Um, yeah, she, after immigrating, was able to practice midwifery, which is what she was trained in. Classic immigrant woman badass narrative. So she went to art school, also acquired massive student debt, but uh, as the spawn, I had the luxury of growing up with an artist parent. Um, and uh, also my dad's, he's pretty cool too, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so can you tell us a bit about the like the video and what it traces. Yeah, um, so uh, this film is, it was all shot in 2010 in February when I spent a month with my yaya. And uh, there were a lot of, it's funny, I filmed on film and digital, but really ultimately like the analog was what spoke more to the things I was looking at exploring in the work. And I still work primarily with analog film on 16 millimeter and super eight millimeter. Um, and there are some other family members featured in the work. A friend came out to help me film. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I also, I, I want to get back to Lido, but before I do that, I want to ask you, Shimpi, about the question around future making um, and how you're approaching that in your practice as a visual artist and also now as an administrator, because I know you spend most of your time doing the administrator side. So can you tell us a little bit about your, what that work of future making looks like for you? Yeah, as someone who's fallen into the web of arts administration, uh, <laughs> uh, future making for me is really holding tender space for other talented artists to make work where they don't feel gazed at or like a demographic that's uh, underserved needing supports as an other. It's very much about by and for and um, uplifting people who already have so much to offer. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this next question is kind of around the, the subject matter and the theme that I see present in both of your um, practices as visual artists. Um, so I think one of the themes that really stands out for me is the ways that you both approach a relational practice to your ancestors and to your kin. Um, and so, so Lido, um, I want to, I want you to talk to us about the subject matter of memories and how that presents in your work, um, especially just thinking about a lot of the portraits that you tend to make in your work. I think you've talked about them representing some of the people that you grew up with. Um, so I'm interested in that and I'm also interested in like Afro-Indigenous spiritualities and rituals how that takes shape in your work, especially having left Colombia quite quite some time ago. Yeah, um, I, I make portraits because I find them interesting. Um, 
I find people interesting. I love to to watch people speak. I, I like to observe people's eyes, how they move and noses and mouths. I think it's it's really interesting and that's how I, I started being more um, involved um, in, in portraiture. Um, even when I was very young, when I was, you know, 13, 12, I would, well, at that, at that age, I, would, I was listening to a lot of metal and like punk and hardcore. And in metal, they have, or I say we, because I still love metal, but we love um, anything that is like gore, guttural, and like talks about like death and, and, and blood and the blood that is coming out and oozing out of your mouth. You know, I don't know why, but it's just this obsession with like corpse and death. And, and I never really thought about it, but um, in the, during, at the height of the pandemic and having family members passing on and not being able to be in ceremony. So in my, in my mother's side, we are Wayu and I see a, a bag from the territory. Can you, can you show it? Yeah. Two people. Beautiful. So, so that is a mochila wayu and it's, it's a handbag that's been weaved and that's that's the art of, of my people only that it would be called craft because you know the indians they don't make art they make craft um so to me um in the ceremony when someone passes on in my family we do something called which it, it it's common in 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 some um Af african communities in colombia in colombia too but we we call it las nueve noches which is which translates to the nine nights mm -hmm. so essentially you know when your relative passes on you honor them with prayer and with presence and tons of food for nine days and nine nights so when at the height at the height of the of the of the pandemic when um, our relatives that passed on passed on some of our relatives were not even able to be near the body so that was really traumatic and and it got me thinking you know just and i remember listening to a lot of metal when that was happening and then i was like oh i understood it's just like i think my fascination or attraction to this specific and aggressive and dark um musical genre it has to do with with ceremony and with accepting death um as something that happens when you're alive you know and and then on the other side of that is as someone who has given birth twice, you know, when you give birth, you're so close to dying, you know, even if it's a C-section, so much that can happen that can go wrong and, and the person giving birth can can die, you know? So, so I guess that's where a lot of the inspiration in my work comes from, you know, and how I integrate unconsciously. Even I'm very intentional with my work, but I, I try not to use my culture um, or my family's culture as something that, you know, I own and I can do whatever I want with because I don't think it's respectful. So when I'm in my territory with my family and I do want to do anything that is ceremonious, you know, like my elders will be, will be present. In my work and in my lived experience as someone that's uh, Afro-Caribbean and, and Wayu and Wahida, all of those things together, you know, and you can see it like even in, in that image there for from Miss Columbia, it was all about, you know, going back to the places, but not even going back because I am half of the year or at least three months out of the year, I will be in Colombia with, with my family, yeah. you know, making the work and, 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 and the work that that people see is 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 a snippet of my lived experience. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, one of the things that resonates with me just now as you're talking is the nine nights because I'm Jamaican, we do the same thing when people pass on. Mm -hmm. So I really love those Afro-Caribbean connections. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Um, yeah, and I think that just gives us more insight as well as to why you make the work that you do um, because the portraits just, it, those really resonate with me. Um, and so, Shimbi, um, just following the same line of questioning around uh, connections to ancestors and kin, um, you know, that's present in your work as well, particularly in this video. Um, 
your connections are a lot less clear. You're you're not spending half your year in. Um, but yeah, not yet. When you retire at 45, <laughs> um, but so you will be spending your time um, in Ethiopia and or Greece. Um, but can you talk to us? Yeah, just about those, um, just about those connections, and particularly in this work. Um, I guess a bit of the discrepancy between the, the expectations and the realities for you in terms of what it was like to meet and get to know your grandmother and get to know your Greek and Ethiopian cultures better. Yeah, I uh, was born and raised in diaspora and that has a disconnect from certain things, but also a replication of things from a certain era of diasporic departure. And there were lots of ceremony or ways of honoring or connecting to tradition, to ancestors, to people's mortality and passing that existed in distance for me. And yeah, it's just, it's interesting to think about exploring that because it's an absence, but it hasn't felt like a void. Life is full, even when, at least for me, uh, when there's a disconnect and I really try and honor that tension. Uh, my relationship with my Yaya before making that film project was mostly through the telephone over distance. Um, we did go and visit when I was a child. And I did visit her once before with my sibling. Shout out to Teddy, who's watching this after the live Shout stream. Shout out to Teddy. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did go and visit her when she was still in Athens when we were both teens. So, it wasn't like a first meeting, but it was definitely a first foray into bridging and emergent and yeah. young adult longing that's intentional. Um, fun fact, I'm named after her. I'm the only grandchild named after her. My legal first name is Hagar Salam, which is hers. And I think that makes me feel a certain kind of connection as well and a certain kind of desire to honor that relationship. And she's the only living grandparent in the family. And I think that folks that grow up around their grandparents have a relational proximity that is not a part of my life. Uh, but there's still a lot of love. And I think that the intention around connecting to someone in that way in a latent way uh, can be just as special. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, just really thinking about that diasporic experience and that kind of longing, I guess, or yearning for those connections. Yeah, longing and yearning, I think, is a, a common thread in a lot of, you know, creators that are, are either immigrants or that are raised by the diaspora, by their diaspora. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's inspiring and it's beautiful in, in how, breaking, how, how heartbreaking it is. Um, and I mean, it, it, it's something that I've always found so curious about living in a quote unquote North American society where, you know, you, you, you go to school and you like, you meet your friends and, and, and people that were born and raised here, they don't have the same relationship that, you know, some that we would have with our grandparents that are away and they have them an hour away, but they'll see them only when it's Thanksgiving time, you know, and like all those things, they, to me, all those questions inform the work and it informs, you know, the intention behind the work. And, 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 and as a mother to three kids, you know, 
is um, I'm always concerned about, wow, like are my kids gonna be able to, you know, have that same connection that I have to, you know, where, where, I, where I grew up and will they have a connection to that place and I want them to, to have that. So, I mean, I'm currently in that process of, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm moving back, you know, I want my kids to have that experience, you know, and like I'm finally getting to a place where I can do that safely. Um, and well, it's safe. I just have to convince my baby daddy, but he's convinced we are going to go uh, eventually next year. And, and that my, my, my son is 14 years old, you know, and he's, he's pretty talented musician and pianist, you know, and um, because of my experience in music and meeting so many musicians, especially in the classical world, uh, it, they're so interesting. There's so interesting, but, but some of them are so obsessed with their instrument. That's all they know. And I worry that my son is going to be a pianist that that's all he's going to be worrying about. And I'm like, my son does not really know how to dance. <laughs> he needs to go home and learn how to dance and then be a pianist that does the Chopin and the Beethoven and all that stuff, but also can bust a move, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so you said you're going to be wanting to move back to Colombia? Yes, I am in the process of actually doing that. I mean, Canada is always going to be here, you know, but, but, and I'm always going to have and collaborate, you know, just so we're going to collaborate, you know, like it's all going to happen. Visiting, like, I, you're going to miss, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but there's something about, you know, because I, I, I was in Toronto, but we moved to, to London, Ontario not too long ago um, so that the kids would have a, a forest, you know, but they can really climb up those trees, you know, like I need my daughter to know how to climb up a mango tree yeah. and shake the branches so the mangoes fall. I want, you know, I don't know why. And I, I have to, I don't know, talk to someone about this, but like, why do I want my daughter to have my same experience? Why? Like she can have her own experience, connect with the snow. No, I don't connect with the snow. <laughs> yeah. We are going to the, Colombia. The amount of times I've asked my mom to describe like living in proximity to mango trees, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah. At the beach. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, there's just some things, you know, like, and I, you know, I, I'm so um, happy that, I, that I've been able to connect so much and, and create so much and do so much with all the complications and problems and drama, you know, you Google me up and there's so much drama in Canada. But, um, but it's also so wonderful to have a place that I can go back to and also have drama. <laughs> a different kind of drama. It's a different kind of drama, so, but you know, it's okay. yeah. So, yeah, um, I think that connection to place is super important. So it, it, it looks different, right? Like we're all in, in the diaspora, but in different ways. And so our experiences and our connections to home, I guess, is is different. Um, so I, I also want to talk to you um, about your video work too, Lido, um, because I think you're, you're a video artist as well, in the sense that you do a lot of the creative direction for your music videos, um, which are, you know, it's part of your, that extension of your visual art practice. So can you just talk to us about your process in terms of um, the creative direction? Particularly, I'm thinking about the field of music videos as one that's heavily male-dominated. We talked about patriarchy. And so what does that mean and look like for you to prioritize Afro-Indigenous women um, in such a male-dominated field? Um, I don't really think that the when it comes to context of the world in relationship to my work, and I do that intentionally because I feel like there is such a weight on the shoulder of whoever is a creator who isn't white. Um, because somehow, you know, if I want to write a song about a flower, now that is the flower of the revolution. No, I don't want this to be the flower of the revolution. I just want this to be a flower. I want this to be a song about a flower and how it smells so nice. No, but when you smell it, when you smell it, do you smell? The scream and the pain of your ancestor. No, I don't. It is a flower, you know. So when I do my videos, you know, they're visions. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a visionary. I'm, I'm, 
I'm fantastic, I'm fabulous, I'm an artist, I'm an artist. So I just want to make my videos, you know, so I can be in front of the camera and behind the camera. So what I do is that I write my, uh, I make a storyboards and I write the treatment. And then, you know, I get a team of people that, you know, I like, and then we get together and, and make the videos, you know. And it all starts with, you know, a dream. It, sometimes I'm washing the dishes or I'm, really, you know, I'm washing the dishes or I'm with my, you know, yesterday I had a vision. I was at the airport. I got off the plane and I told my baby daddy, like, I want to go to the hotel and cry myself to sleep <laughs> <laughs> because we've had a terrible week flying, like luggage loss, instruments sent to yeah. other countries. It's been really bad. And, but then when we were waiting for the luggage, I had a vision of Erica Badu dancing to one of my songs that I wrote about a mango and she's slithering around and da 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 da. So I was just like, after I cry myself to sleep, I'm gonna call my management and see if we can get a hold of Erica Badu. You know, like I just, it, it's That's just like nice. that. It's not, it's not like me as an Afro-Colombian indigenous woman, queer, mother, I don't, I, that's not what I do. I don't think of my, as myself as anything, but I'm a human being that creates, you know? I feel like all of the other adjectives and all the other things are pushed onto me. Um, and I just try to make beauty, you know? That's, I just wanna make beauty. I just wanna make work that is sublime when you see it, so I feel like, my work in the past is 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 going towards that. Like that's that's the goal. Like making something that is timeless, something that is inspiring, something that is tender, that it's raw, that it you, that it, that is real. You know. But I don't really um, I don't really think in the context of because of course is a male dominated. <laughs> You know, it's just like, what am I going to do thinking about that? I'm just going to be it and I'm going to hire as many women, not because they're women. I'm not going to hire trans folk just because they're trans. I'm not going to hire gay folks just because they're gay. I'm hiring the top of the top, the best of the best that I can afford. And they happen to be women and they happen to be trans and they happen to be gay, you know, so that, you know, and I happen to be you know, was born wherever I was born, and I want to make a video about a mango, and it's a mango, and it's a sexual innuendo, but you'll find that out later. But that's what it is. It's not the mango of the revolution. So I feel like once I'm serious and I'm intentional about that, then the rest will come, and whatever people want to think about it, and, you know, when you see it at the shows, you know, people will cry, and, you know, and they'll tell you their whole life story, and I'm like, okay, that's intense, but good for you. Oh, emergency. someone yeah. is lost. El clima? Okay, all right, cool. Okay, it's not an amber alert. Okay. It's the weather, it's hot. Um, what is it? Is it an amber alert? Oh, no. Tormenta, okay, all right. Storm, okay, all right. Um, yeah, you see, the patriarchy was listening to me. Yeah, I'm so sure. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, it makes me think about this artist's work. Um, uh, there's this photographer, Michelle Pearson Clark, and she did um, an exhibition where essentially there are portraits of all these black people in Toronto. And then she was like, you know, people keep saying to me, oh, like, what is this critiquing? What is this like commenting on about like the black experience? Blah, blah, blah. She's like, actually, no, it's just me like, you know, testing out my technique with, with a camera. Like, I'm just trying to like be a better photographer. And why can't the work just be about that? Like, why does it have to be read into um, in in all these ways? It's it's about me and my camera. So <laughs> I think that's because the art world is so full of full of excrement. It's so full of what? It's like full of poop. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Because I feel like so much of the art world, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm putting my curatorial hat on, it's so much about the story behind the piece, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. like you have to convince people, and I think that there's so much, and, and especially the canon, the canonic work of, you know, the European men, you know, doing their work, especially the abusers, especially the cultural appropriators, you know, we all know them. Um, that and it is like they regurgitate so much information so to make it valid and she's like this is the blue period 
the blue period, the blue, <laughs> you know? So I just like, and anything that is done now, it's like, well, what is your, what period are you on? Like what, you know, they're like, no, I'm in my mass period, my mass period. Like, I don't, you know, like so much of it, I think like you have to, not only do we have to think about the work, we also have to justify it. And I feel like strong work does not need to be justified. Like you, you, you vaguely talked about your piece. I see it, I saw it, I was walking around, I saw it, I feel it. I don't need you justify it, validate it. I see it, it's right there in front of me. So it's, it's difficult when an art has to be so explained and then that is being, it gets pushed onto us when you want to do a picture of black people because lenses are not made to take photos of, of people that have darker skin. So that's it. You know, that should be the statement. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, yeah, what should be, what's, what's your take on that? I mean, I think it has to do with capitalism and patriarchy, but we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so should be. I don't know, the art world, the canon, I don't know them. <laughs> I know a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know her. Um, I think the thing about coming of age as an artist separate from those contexts of learning is I don't, um, have that internal orientation. Um, there's a lot more world building, as it were, and looking to my mother, looking to my sibling, who's also a filmmaker, looking to people I long to know, both in terms of the work that they make and also interpersonally. Something that matters to me a great deal is the vast relational network of people who make work and there's room to be friends of friends of friends. You know, I take friendship um, with a lot of care and tenderness and seriousness. And I think that's more central to my arts and relational practice than the so-called canon that was never there for me other than a subject to be gazed at in the background. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Um. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, and just thinking about friendship as well, um, because we're also friends. <laughs> so. Shout out to friendship. <laughs> Shout out to friendship. And um, yeah, thinking about the overlaps between friendship and, and work and um, yeah, relations. Um, yeah, but but really, I do think it's because of capitalism and patriarchy. Why why are you kind of forced, I guess, to um, bring all these layers that may not necessarily make sense? But anyway, we'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so my my last question before we get to the Q and A part from the audience is um, uh, maybe I can also get a time check from Amber. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, just I just want to know what's next um, for both of you guys in terms of, you know, we know that you're performing tonight, um, and everyone's going to go and check out Lido's performance tonight. What time exactly? Time again? I believe it's 10.45. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Have some coffee. You'll be fine. You'll be great. Uh, <laughs> But thinking about what's next for your practice as a visual artist, um, when are you creating? What are you creating? What do you want to create that you haven't yet? I'm making new songs. Um, I'm working on my record for hopefully next year. And it is exploring why we're still alive, what's, what's worth living for. Um, it's about hope and 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 love, self-love, just all the things that in my world make make sense that I'm that I'm still here after so much devastation in 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 my life and in the life of humanity. And the music itself. Um, 
I, the genesis of it was the music that I wrote for the orchestra at the New York City Ballet. Um, but I knew that they were gonna own it for a bit. So I just gave them little bits of it. And then I created um, more more music for that. So I'm, I'm working on that just because also, because I'm from Colombia, it's, it's impossible to get away from the world music label. Um, it's really annoying. Uh, so I was just like, okay, let's see if um, I make uh, orchestral music or symphonic music and then it's called world music. So um, we'll see what happens with that. But um, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm writing songs for other people. Um, I'm learning how to do pop, like P-O-P. Boom, pop! Um, not for myself, but for other people. I'm being mentored by the great Nelly Furtado. And she, um, Furtado. yeah, she's amazing. And um, I convinced her to um, get back to music for the world. So we're working on an album for her. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm writing music for like other people. So that's a good exercise that I'm doing because my music is so intense. Um, and like the stuff that I talk about, it's so intense. So it's nice to just write about you know, making a song for people on the dance floor to have fun too, you know, because if you translate my lyrics, <laughs> get the Kleenex out. Um, so um, that that's pretty much it, you know, and, and again, we're vindicating the um, Caribbean as sublime, as opposed to exotic, as it um, so often it, it, it gets described as, and it, it re really bothers me, you know? So I find a lot of art and beauty in the chaos of, you know, so many um, of the quote unquote third world countries, you know? So that's that's pretty much it. I'm like, I'm like, what unites us as, as a people, you know? And in terms of the visuals that go with that, I am making sculpture, um, made out of plastic chairs, which in Colombia we call sillas rimax, but I think like in every Afro-diasporic home, there's this like specific plastic chair. So I was just like, oh wow, all of this ancestral wisdom and we're all united by plastic. So that's that's what I'm like, making sculptures out of, out of out of that. So we'll see how that, that turns out. Well, thank you. Do you have any shows coming up for your artwork? Um, we'll anything? see what, I don't know about next year. I know okay. what happens until November. Okay. And then I don't know what happens after that. I'm just, uh, the music, music is weird. Like you make the music today, but then you hear it out in like six months to a year later. So by the time that it comes out, you're already bored with it and you've already made new songs and you're moved on, you know? So I'm trying to, not deliver things so soon so that I can still enjoy that process. So we'll see, we'll, we'll see. Okay, okay, cool. Stream Nelly from Tato. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and so, Shimbi, what's next? Um, I just have to say there's like, from some of Nelly's mural work, there's a song called Pipe Dreams that I have on repeat, it's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's next? I am really starting to enjoy working with other people and their visions. Uh, just today I had the great pleasure of working with two friends who are here today um, as a videographer for a project they have in the works. and being able to hold that kind of special and sacred space behind the camera is just so meaningful to me. Um, just as really, it feels just as meaningful as making my own work when it gets to be in community. And in terms of my own practice, next month I'll be going back to Greece and finishing filming on 16 for a project about a beloved uncle of mine. Cool. Oh, I forgot about something. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I I did a TV show. 
Um, and it's going to be out sometime in September from by CBC. Okay. I forgot about that. Yeah, it's uh, it's called Lido TV. It's called what? Lido TV. Lido TV. It's okay. a variety show. That's perfect. Yeah. When does it come out again? It's somewhere in September. They're going to announce it. I mean, they announced it on their their thing was like, these are the shows that are going to come out in the year. But I don't, I don't want to, I don't think I can say exactly anything because they have like a whole okay. thing prepared. But it's going to be cool because we're going to be talking about different things like, like beauty and feminism and colonialism. And on the episode of beauty, um, my son wrote the music for one of the songs that I wrote. Um, do you want to hear it? It's very short. Yeah, it's it's when we're we have a final thoughts like closing thoughts, and I'm there with my with my puppets, and we're thinking about how hard it's to talk about beauty, and then I just say you know something that my wise indigenous grandmother used to say, no es que eres fea, es que eres pobre, and it translates translates into something beautiful. Um, it goes like. You're not ugly, you're just poor. You're not ugly, you're just poor. You're not ugly, you're just poor. You're not ugly, you are just poor. So that's a sneak peek into Lido TV. Tune in, tune in. Tune in to Lido TV. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to Lido Chibi. Do we have a few questions? We we only have time maybe for like maybe like two. Um, okay. So all right, let's start with Jesse and Moses. So go ahead. For uh, Lido, like I uh, I really relate to you listening to like heavy metal and comes to deal with like things in life. And I like but I lost my mom to cancer last year. So I had a lot of anger for many months, and like on top of that, like think of colonialism and the patriarchy and capitalism and homophobia, and then and then and then. So I'm curious, who do you like to listen to for heavy metal when you feel like you need some heavy metal and punk? I'm curious. Well, my my uh, holy trinity. Um, so I start with Kitty, which are actually from London, Ontario. Okay, they they started uh, as teenagers. Um, and their kitty, and then I go to Fear Factory, yeah. and then I go to Cradle of Filth. <laughs> They're from England, <laughs> and then you know, as a B side, you know, I'll do a little bit of Sepultura and Six Feet Under. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, let's get to Samra first. Hi, thanks everybody. I have a question thinking about being creative in so-called unconventional spaces and who gets to decide what's conventional and unconventional. So for Lido, you've been very, very vocal about your love of Dufferin Mall. And I want to hear about, tell us about your love of Dufferin Mall. And then, Shippy, I want to tell you for us to tell us about what would be your spiritual equivalent? What's your spiritual Dufferin Mall? <laughs> And are people familiar with the Duffer Mall? So the Duffer Mall is a mall that is on the West End in Toronto. And it's just a mall that is so mediocre, it's perfect. Because you won't get, like the best store there is H&M, right? Like that. <laughs> um, and, um, but it's wonderful because it's my home away from home. Because when you go to the food, co food court, you'll see people from all around the world. And there's like little neighborhoods inside the Duffer Mall. What do I mean by this? You go up the escalator and then there's going to be in whatever little seating area next to the juice place, there's a group of old Portuguese men complaining about whatever they are complaining. And I love that. And then you go past the Tim Hortons, which always has the longest line. And then, you know, it's kind of like, okay, this is the Canadian race to get to the food court. And I love it because I'm there with my kids and they're listening to so many languages, you know, and I feel like it's such a reflection of the redeeming qualities of this place, which is, you know, via, you know, immigration and all of us having to be stuck together. 
you know, because a lot of those people, they don't want to be together. And like culturally, so many of those countries don't even get along. But you're at the food court and you're eating your little McDonald's and you got to get along. And, I, and that only happens in that way at the Dufferin Mall because it's not rich. You know, it's not like Yorkdale or whatever. It's like it's, it's the Dufferin Mall, you know, and it has the no frills. Joe's no frills. Are you kidding me? And the exotic the exotic ethnic aisle, it has all the Colombian food. So it just, it's a whole way from home. So I recommend when you go, if you've never been to Toronto, forget about the ROM, forget about the AGO, forget about Ripley, the, the, sh go to the Dufferin Mall. Shout out to Dufferin Mall. Yeah. I haven't been there in a long time. Yes, I love it. So, yeah, so what's your equivalent? Um, well, you know, I'm a Winnipeg guy, so. Shout out to Portage Place, you know, it's, uh, it was a weird fever dream of <laughs> some developers, architects, and city planners, and uh, it exists as a vestige of that, and <laughs> at one point, it had a, a key tenant, uh, McNally Robinson, the bookstore, uh, which is now a service Canada. <laughs> Uh, it also had an IMAX and an art house cinema called the Globe Theater. Um, right now it has the PTE, the Prairie Theater Exchange, but it has a lot of small uh, shops, small shops, uh, food court that is always inhabited along Aston Horton's line, a salon ran, ran by Eritreans and Ethiopians on the main floor. And there are so many skywalks in Winnipeg's downtown, you can kind of access the Portage Place Mall from most other buildings. Ameka, you would say. Ameka, one would say, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think just in terms of contestation of place and space, as human geographers would put it, the way that Portage Place is inhabited now is very different from the vision, which was about consumption, was about um, a whiteness and whitening of downtown Winnipeg, which has experienced all kinds of, you know, donutting <laughs> of folks not being in the urban core. And now that the Winnipeg Jets are back, you know, there's this sort of desire for the downtown core to be rebranded in this very white middle class way where uh, sometimes people will come in for events and then go back to the suburbs and other times uh, people will buy condos there and live where the action happens but they're such a vibrant community that's not just rooted in that and oftentimes you know you'll just go to Portage Place to get some cheap eats or some cute clothes I mean, they just started, it's very recent, the jerk place. That's when, you know, it, it just got better at the, at the Duffer Mall with yeah. the jerk place. It, it's, it's, it's pretty wild to think about how things like that come to be and whose visions push it forward because it's so many systems that have to, to agree on it. Yeah, like if I actually use my curatorial degree, that's where I would do my art shows, mm. like malls. Just the mall, because it's like, everyone wants to go to the mall, no one wants to go to a gallery. <laughs> I don't want to go to a gallery. Except know? for Dunlop Art Gallery. Except for Dunlop Art Gallery. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just like, it's it's that, it's that the distance that, that art, the art world creates, right? That it's so hard to reach people. And then when you convince your friends to go to the gallery, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing, yes. Art is great, but when you create that division, so very much like when they create the, these malls as this is where people with money are gonna come spend their money, and then no, this is where we with no money are gonna hang out because there's air conditioner and free Wi-Fi. That's why we're gonna go. So to me, it's like, yes, like that would be an incredible insulation. And actually, there I, there have been artists, there was an artist that did, it'll come to me later, but they did like a whole, uh, performance at the Duffer Mall, I think in the 90s. So, you know, why not? You know, art everywhere, and it includes the mall. It's a 
Doing them all, including <laughs> libraries too. We're a gallery inside a library. So um, I think, do we have time for one more? I think there was a, qu a question over here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you, you know, how was the so, so how was the transformation to go like to ride donkeys, to go burn blood and climb in mango trees, and have those um, have those like inspirations like in the manly world of humanity, joy, you know, and. And to be able to escape in that kind of like you have to stay at home, take care of the kids, and then end that in East Colombia. That's such a, you know, such a like kind of bringing all those roots. And yeah, I was like coming from like running the streets from Indonesia and Rama to be here talking to us. <sighs> we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you just have to do what you have to do. You know, when I when I, I didn't move here uh, to find myself, as you would go to India to find yourself. I came because um, political turmoil, you know, so I had to come. It, it was my mother's belief that living in Ontario, in London, Ontario, it was going to be a safe place for us. So you, you know, I have to listen to your mother. And then you start realizing you know, where you live, you know, um, you prepare yourself to now live in Canada, the best country in the world where there's no racism. Um, and where the Eskimos are in a museum, uh, because that is what's in the books, you know, and, you know, I think the only, the, 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 the big thing, you know, after living here for 15 years, so half my life, it would have been so nice to know that there were indigenous people living here. It would have made me feel, or my transitioning to this new society, it would have hurt less to know that there were people that were like me, you know, especially because once you know the true history of how this, you know, colonial project called Canada came to be, you know, if you know the history, you know, it's like, it just relaxes you, you know, it's like, we're all in on the joke and we can all at least be happy that we're not England. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like at least we, we can just say that we can like laugh at that in, in, in this collective pain and like this dark history, you know? And it also is important, like as immigrants, that like, you know how to come back, you know, you need to clap back, you need to come back. So when the first Aryan specimen tells you to go back to your country, you can be like, then are you going to go back to Europe? You know, like those things, like it's, it's really important to know, you know, so I guess that's been my biggest lesson into making the work that I make and just being hyper aware and using humor as a song, as, 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 as a way to bring us all together, because there's no reason to keep fighting. You know, it's just we just need to come to terms with the realities of our past. Just like in Colombia, Colombia is no perfect place, you know. I'm going back fully aware that, you know, the cat calling that I never get here, you know, I will be getting it back home, you know. So, like, there's so much that is wrong here, but it's also wrong there. Again, tra drama there, drama here, like, drama everywhere. But at least, you know, I've made it my, my mission question mark to just be aware of where I am so that I know where I'm going, especially because I have the responsibility of these three damn kids that I gotta raise, you know what I'm saying? Like, I gotta make sure that these kids are safe. And if they don't know anything and that they think that they're living in this magical place where nothing wrong happens, I'm not doing them a favor, you know? So that's how, you know, you end up making work that makes sense and that it resonates with people because it's charged with with life and it's charged with death and it's charged with pain but it, it's also charged with love beautiful today we're getting a new a new the new presidents the new president and vice president are getting um sworn in and in 212 or 14 years we've never had uh, democracy. Well, we've had democracy, but we've never had a left-wing uh, government. That's 200 years where we've been, 
you know, in a military freaking state. So today, you know, we'll see what's going to happen. We're, we're full of, I'm full of hope, at least, at least me. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. of our talk. I encourage you to stick around and check out the, the work in the exhibition. Um, and of course, tonight, tonight, Lido is going to be headlining for the Vagina Folk Festival, so make sure you check her out tonight. Thank you all for being We're here. And, <laughs> just have some coffee, have some Red Bull, and uh, check out Lido. Thank you so much for coming.